News of the Times, Wicked Wednesdays, The Gibbeted Ones. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at three cases that resulted in the ultimate penalty, even beyond the penalty of anatomization, being hung in chains or gibbeted. To be condemned in this way, the crime would have been perceived as being one of the very worst of crimes. Our first case, from 1776, involves an assistant butcher, Samuel Thorley, who has often wondered whether human flesh does indeed taste like pork, as he has been told. He decides to find out. Our second case, from 1815, involves Anthony Lingard the Younger, who has found out that he is the father of one of the local girls he has seduced. This means that he will be financially responsible for the child and the mother for over a decade to come. Antony has come up with a plan to avoid the financial costs coming. Our last case is the famous Cook Pass case. Cook from a respectable family owes money to Mr. Pass, who is holding Cook to a strict deadline. Aware that the enforcement of the payment will possibly bankrupt him, Cook explodes into a horrific attack bent on Pass's total annihilation. This case was the last case of gibbeting as punishment within England. Three cases of murder ending in the ultimate punishment of gibbeting is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Gibbeting. Gibbeting refers to the practice of displaying the bodies of executed criminals in metal cages known as gibbets in public places. The bodies would be left to decompose and be consumed by birds as a warning to others. Gibbeting was often reserved for particularly heinous crimes, such as murder, treason, or highway robbery. The intention was to instill fear in the local population and discourage criminal behaviour. The gibbets were typically placed in prominent locations, such as crossroads or hilltops, where they could be easily seen by the passer-by. The practice was officially abolished in England in 1834 as part of a broader reform to the criminal justice system in England at the time. Our first case takes place on the 26th of November 1776 with the discovery of dismembered bits of a body floating in the brook. The discovery by a local farmer brings the police and the community to the scene. A local woman recognises the dress that is fished out as belonging to Anne Smith, who was meant to sing locally a week before, but who had not turned up. Searches are made for clues, such as a blood trail, to attempt to find a trace of the murderer, but there is no success. One of the local women, however, remembers local butcher Samuel Thorley bringing her what he claimed was some pork that he had been given to him. It was wet through. He had stated that he had fallen in the brook. His butcher's apron was particularly bloody. From the Oxford Journal, the 7th of December, 1776, in our last, we mentioned the commitment of one Samuel Thorley to our county jail for the murder of Anne Smith, since which we have been favoured with the following particulars of that unparalleled act of barbarity. On Saturday last, a female body was discovered floating in the brook, in this town, mangled in the following shocking manner. The tongue cut out of the mouth, the head, arms, thighs and legs severed from the trunk and from each other, the viscera floating in different places on the surface of the water, 
and the abdominal and several other muscles missing. The above horrid murder was Sunday discovered to be committed by one Samuel Thorley, who has for several years assisted the butchers in his neighbourhood and was in general looked upon as a man of very furious temper. The muscular parts which were wanting he took home and ate as part of them on Sunday noon, telling the people with whom he lodged that it was pork which had been given to him. This, together with his well-known disposition, led to the discovery, and he is now safely lodged in the castle of Chester, in order to take his trial at the next assizes. The unfortunate victim of this wretch's cruelty proves to be a poor woman who sings ballads, gathered rags, etc., in and about Congleton. It is well known that the prisoner was not in necessitous circumstances, nor does it appear from his own account that the woman had by any means provoked him. Locked up. Thorley confesses rather quickly. The trial takes place as a formality. What everybody wants to understand is why. His explanation is his wish to see if human flesh tasted like pork. From the Northampton Mercury, the 21st of April, 1777, the murder of Anne Smith. On Tuesday was tried at Chester Assizes Samuel Thorley, a butcher's follower of Congleton in that county, for the murder of Anne Smith, a ballad singer, aged 22. This transaction was attended with such horrid circumstances of deliberate cruelty and savage barbarity as we would hope for the honour of humanity will henceforward remain unparalleled. It appeared in proof that the prisoner met the deceased in a footway near Congleton and prevailed upon her to accompany him to a hollow place at a small distance from the road where he severed her head from her body, he cut her arms, legs, thighs, and breasts off. He took her bowels and tongue out, and after having cut off the calves of her legs and other fleshy parts, he threw what remained of the carcass into a brook. His motive for thus disjointing her was very probably a belief that these small parts would be speedily carried by the flood into a river that was of no great distance from the brook. Having by these means, as he thought, secured himself from a possibility of detection, he placed a part he designed for food in his apron, carried it to his house of an old woman, and told her that he had received it from a butcher who had been driving pigs on the road, on which he had been given the flesh of one that died and which he desired she would put by for him. The next morning he called upon her and asked leave to broil what is called his pork, which, being granted after dressing, he eats as part of it for breakfast. Finding it disagreed with him, he desired the woman to throw the remainder away. But her daughter, who looked upon it as real pork, boiled it for the grease. Soon after, some men who had occasion to pass by the brook observed a petticoat in the water, which awakened their suspicion. They attentively searched and found all the limbs, the breasts and tongue of a human body, and removed them to a barn. The head and face being seen by an old woman in the neighbourhood, she instantly exclaimed, "'It is poor Anne Smith!' the ballad singer. It should not be omitted that the prisoner assisted in searching for the remains of the body and expressed a strong detestation of the unknown murderer. On his being questioned, what could induce him to commit so horrid a crime? He answered that having frequently heard that human flesh resembled young pig in taste, 
curiosity led him to try and see if it was true. After full proof of the above act, the jury found the prisoner guilty and he was sentenced to be hanged and afterwards gibbeted on a heath near Colgleton, not far from the place where the fact was committed. He was on Thursday executed, agreeable to his sentence, and on Friday his body hung in chains to the general satisfaction of the inhabitants of Congleton and its neighbourhood. He appeared to be upwards of fifty years of age. He didn't show the least remorse for the horrid and unparalleled crime he had committed, and behaved, upon the whole, with the greatest unconcern and indifference. Our second case from 1815 involves a lad whose seductive ways have now led him to be an expectant father. He would be pressured to marry her once she named him as the father, and he would be held responsible for her and the child's care financially, whether he married her or not. The parishes were quite strenuous in their efforts to name the fathers of expectant women, otherwise the burden of care would fall on the parish. A terrible murder takes place at the local toll booth with the murder and robbery of poor widow Hannah Oliver. The widow did not have much, but she did have a new pair of shoes. Lingard approached the pregnant girl carrying his child and offers a bribe of some money and a pair of new shoes if only she will tell the parish that is an, it is another who is the father of her child and not him. The girl, aware of the recent murder of Hannah Oliver, can see there is something wrong with the bribe and tells him no. Not only that, she ends up testifying against him. From the London Chronicle on the 5th of April 1815, Derby Assizes. Anthony Lingard the Younger was tried for the murder by strangulation of Hannah Oliver, a widow woman aged 48 years who kept the turnpike gate at Wardlow Mears, parish of Tidsworth. It appears in evidence that the prisoner committed the robbery and murder in the night of Sunday the 5th of January last, that he took from the house several pounds in cash and a pair of women's new shoes. That immediately after the deed was perpetrated, he went to a young woman in the neighbourhood who had been seduced by him, and offered to give her some money if she would affiliate the child upon some other person, that he gave her the shoes and also some money. But it being rumoured that Hannah Oliver had been murdered and that a pair of shoes had been taken from her, the young woman returned the shoes to the prisoner who said that she had no occasion to be afraid for that he had them of a person in exchange for a pair of stockings. The shoes were, however, returned to him, and the evidence adduced in respect to them, as well as other circumstances, clearly established the guilt of the prisoner, independent of his own confession before the magistrate. He was found guilty and executed on Tuesday, maintaining a sullen insensibility though he acknowledged the justice of the sentence. The body is hung in chains. Our last case is the famous James Cook case of 1834, the last case of gibbeting in England. Cook, a young man from a respectable family, has recently taken over the bookbinding business of the recently deceased master whom he had worked for. There were apparently considerable debts associated with the business before he took on the business. Mr. Pass manufactured brass pieces used by bookbinders. He writes a letter to Mr. Cook stating that he will be in the area and will come to collect the debt owed. There is some confusion as it would seem that there were two separate outstanding debts. 
Mr. Pass accordingly stops by the business of Mr. Cook and receives payment in full for one of the bills, but there is another larger bill still outstanding, which Mr. Pass insists must be paid that day. Cook does not have the money. He requests that Mr. Pass come back later in the evening when he states he will have the money then. It does seem from his own testimony that Cook felt he had been hounded by creditors in general. Mr. Pass's refusal to extend time for payment both panicked and infuriated him. As Pass returns in the evening as had been agreed, it is greeted with a flurry of violence and an attempt to utterly annihilate him. A huge fire is later seen, and reports come from the neighbourhoods of a terrible stench being emitted from the house. In the morning, with no answer from Cook and the terrible stench still being emitted, the door is broken down where what looks to be a body part is found on the top of the grate. Cook's contention that the flesh is horse meat is quickly disavowed by the local surgeon. The victim is easily discovered as Mr. Pass, and has not returned to his lodging house as expected. From the broadsides, the August 1832, the arrest of Cook, the murderer. Intelligence has just reached us that the officers of justice have succeeded in apprehending the villain Cook, the murderer of the unfortunate Mr. Pass of Leicester. He was arrested in the parlours of Liverpool on Monday night last. We have not time to give further particulars, but tomorrow we shall be able to lay the whole before our readers. Last night, one of our police, in passing down Wellington Street, was attracted by an unusual light and intolerable stench to a small printing establishment situated up a court in the same street belonging to a person by the name of Cook, from whence he found both the light and smell proceeded. On inquiring, he was told by Cook's son, a man of about twenty-five years of age, that they were burning some horse flesh, and at the same time he saw what he believed to be some. Next day, the neighbours, finding the smell did not abate, assisted upon having the place examined and the nuisance stopped. Neither Cook nor his son were to be found. Suspicion increased. The door of his workshop was burst open, and, oh God, how can I describe the scene which presented itself? In the centre of the brick floor, extended upon yet smoking embers of an immense coal fire, lay the almost consumed trunk of a human being, severed from the upper part of the body, just below the ribs, and divided, evidently, by an axe from the lower extremities. About the middle of the thigh, a part of a knee, part of a shoulder, and some other small remnants of mortality were found amongst the cinders. And in another part of the room lay the feet with the boots and some parts of the trousers attached, divided from the leg a little above the ankle. The head of the unfortunate deceased was nowhere to be found, but a portion of the scalp covered with grey hair was left, a horrid spectacle. His snuff-box lay upon his clothes. Among these was found a letter addressed to Mr. Pass, Hay and Pleasant, Leicester. Inquiry was immediately made at the above hotel, and it appeared that a gentleman with grey hair arrived there on Tuesday last, slept there, dined there, and on Wednesday walked out in the eve evening of that day ordering a bed again. They sat up for the gentleman all night, but he never returned. The name of this gentleman not being known, his trunk was forced open in the presence of two magistrates, and two letters were found directed 
to Mr. Pass, wholesale stationer, Holborn in London. A lad in the employ of Cook and Son states that Mr. Pass called on his master on Tuesday evening, and Cook told him if he would call at the workshop the following evening, it would be settled. In the interim, a large quantity of coals were conveyed to the fatal spot. Neither Cook nor his son are yet in custody. As investigations are immediately commenced, further information transpires that Mr. Cook, who has butchered Mr. Pass, is actually a young lad who only lately has taken over the business of his predecessor, who has died. The shock and horror of the deed extends to around the country. Further particulars. It appears that Mr. Pass was in the habit of travelling in the way of business, and has a small account with the accused cook, who is about twenty-one years of age, and has just succeeded to his master's business in Leicester. Mr. Pass, prior to leaving London on his journey, wrote down from Leicester to Cook to give him to understand when he should be there, desiring that he would be ready with his account. Accordingly, on Wednesday last, he arrived there and stayed at the Stag and Pheasant. In the afternoon, he called upon Mr. Cook, who, according to the statement of the apprentice boy, when Mr. Pass entered, desired him, the apprentice, to go home. Mr. Pass never went back to his inn, and being last seen at the house of Cook, inquiry was made, but nothing could be elicited. However, the neighbours of Cook were much annoyed at the most intolerable stench which proceeded from his house, and he was seen in the act of burning flesh, and upon being asked what he was doing, he said he was burning horse flesh. His conduct being so exceedingly singular, it attracted the attention of the police, who on searching his house discovered the body of a human being cut into different pieces, part of which was burnt and deposited up the chimney. The whole was so disfigured that no trace of feature could be distinguished. The premises and privy were searched, and at length the collar of a coat, a gaiter brace, buckles, etc., were discovered amongst the ashes thrown there from the fire. A pencil and snuff-box were also found, on which the name of the unfortunate gentleman was engraved. Crowds have flocked to the place all day, surgeons, magistrates and gentlemen within the town and, and the country. The coroner's inquest will be held this evening, Friday. Cook, on who the suspicion rests of having perpetrated this hellish murder, is a young man of about twenty-one, who, a short time ago, succeeded to the business of his deceased master. It appears he bought binding tools of Mr. Pass to the amount of about £25, worth approximately three and a half thousand pounds in 2023. It is supposed he effected his purpose by striking the unhappy gentleman on the back of his neck with the binder's press pin, and that he then proceeded to burn the body, all of which, except the parts above mentioned, appear to have been destroyed, as they cannot be discovered. It is supposed that a desire to avoid payments and possess himself of the money of Mr. Pass were the objects which led to perpetrate this awful deed. He was seen with a purse full of sovereigns on Thursday. It is supposed that Cook was all Wednesday night and Thursday morning burning the body. Cook confesses but shows no remorse. The trial takes place in crowded rooms with a queue outside attempting to get in. The ghastliness of the crime makes the national headlines. 
The Horrid Murder, Dismemberment and Burning of Mr. Pass, 1832. The facts of the horrid murder have already appeared in public, and we now proceed to give the final particulars of this wretched individual. The assizes being fixed for the 4th of August, the interest in the town of Leicester, which gave birth to this unparalleled murderer, became most intense, and the applications for admission into town hall, where the trial took place, were more numerous than the oldest inhabitant can remember. Cook, during his incarceration, has, with few exceptions, preserved a sullen calmness. Nothing more than his previous acknowledgement of guilt, in which he firmly asserted, having nearly destroyed the whole of Mr. Pass's remains by fire during the night of the murder, can be got from him. Cook's Confession At a meeting of the borough magistrates in Leicester at the town jail, Cook was brought before them heavily ironed, and although in the presence of gentlemen, to most of whom he had a few days before known under happier circumstances, he betrayed no emotion and his manner was quite composed. He was asked if he chose to state any circumstances connected with the sad case. The magistrates were ready to hear what he had to say, but they had to caution him that it would be taken down in writing. The prisoner, after a short pause, with that firmness of tone and manner, replied as follows. I am innocent of willful murder, and my conscience is not burdened in the manner that you gentlemen seem to suppose. Mr. Pass called on me in the morning, but what, ha what morning I cannot say, as my agitation of mind has been so great ever since. I paid him a bill of twelve shillings, there were two bills due. The other was for a larger sum. Mr. Pass wrote, wrote settled on the twelve-shilling billing, and I told him I would strive to pay the other if he called again in the evening. Mr. Pass did call in the evening, but I was not able to give him anything. He was angry, and I, and I was angry. Disagreeable words took place, and a scuffle ensued, and in this manner... I was brought to this shameful act. The following day, Mr. Burbridge commenced the inquiry by asking him how he felt in himself. The prisoner replied that he was more comfortable in mind than he had hitherto been since the commission of the crime, and that he knew he must suffer for it. Mr. Burbridge then asked how he did it. The prisoner replied, that he had cut up the body and into fragments, and so placed them on the fire. The judge, evidently affected in the most solemn manner, sentenced the prisoner to suffer the severest penalty of the law, to be hanged by the neck and gibbeted. The crime with which the prisoner stood convicted drew tears of anguish from a crowded courtroom. The prisoner was led from the bar to the condemned cell, apparently in the deepest despair of faculty. The fateful morning having arrived, the sheriff and his javelin men proceeded to the county jail, where every preparation had been made to carry into effect the last awful sentence of the law. Cook appeared extremely dejected and downcast, but suffered the operation of pinioning by the executioner with moderate firmness. Several gentlemen, in, independent of the chaplain, conversed most seriously with the prisoner in his last moments, to all of whom he confessed the justice of his sentence. Shortly after, 11 on Friday morning, August the 10th, 1837, he sank into eternity. Cook was hung as usual, and then his body was gibbeted. His body was hung in a specially made for the occasion gibbet outside of Leicester Town. As this was so unusual for the time, it attracted thousands of grisly tourists. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, The Gibbeted Ones. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. 
If you did enjoy the show, we will be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with the unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.